and we're recording. Welcome, folks, whether people at home are watching this on uh, LMC TV or on the streaming feed on YouTube or via Zoom. We appreciate that you're watching. Um, and I will make a motion to open the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, meeting is open. We have, um, we have, I guess as a housekeeping matter, the first thing up is that we have received a request uh, to uh, adjourn the 1165 Grecian Point um, matter that had previously been scheduled for tonight. Uh, I read the letter. I, I, there, I'm not sure I quite understood the reasoning. Uh, it had to do with the with the county's permit, and, and I th I thought where we were is that we weren't holding it up for that, um, Esteban. I I guess I want to I, I want to check in with you. The county's what does the county do when they consider um, the permit? They is it just basically just per test and infiltration? Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Your question. Oh, uh, no, yeah. that was a question. Oh, okay. Uh, pardon. Uh, yeah, they just look at the design uh, and then basically see if the uh, proposed statistic sum is um, acceptable for the require the requirements uh, that the county sets. Um, okay. And if there's any comments, they would usually provide any comments to the applicant's engineer, and he would um, revise as need as needed uh, for approval. Okay. Well, I guess if they couldn't get the permit or had to change something as a result, that would be an issue. I think when when permit agencies are going to drag their feet, we've tried to be as accommodating as we can to to take a a, a temporary or working or uh, or what we can to get an applicant moving forward. But if there's a chance that would change something, but you know, if uh, I'm I'm sort of assuming they get that, they don't take into account the same sort of considerations we do, so. There's, it's, it's a one-way overlap. Uh, they, they need their permit with the county uh, to pass consistency here, but the county doesn't take into consideration the things that we do. So um, anyway, we have, uh, we have uh, moved that off the agenda for tonight, um, which leaves us two applicant items. We have 652 Shore Acres, and then we've got uh, 1025 Rushmore. Uh, let's start with uh, 652 Shore Acres. And I expect applicants council are probably right here with us and can get on. Good evening, Chairman member, members of the commission. Can you hear me all right? Can hear you just fine. Good okay. to see you again, Ms. Motel. Good to see you all as well. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, for the record, Kristen Motel from the law firm Cuddy and Fader. On behalf of the applicants, Caroline Young and Stephen Trachtenbright, who are the owners of the property. Uh, Stephen Trachtenbright is here with us tonight with Caroline. They're waving on their screen to you. Um, also here is Brandon Stewart from Michael Lewis Architects. Uh, Michael Stein and Shay Graham from Hudson Engineering, Stormwater Design. And Carolyn Matthews from William Kenny Associates. They are our wetlands consultant for the project. Um, and it's, it's been a little while since we've been here before you. It was a September, I think, was the last time. Uh, so just, I'm going to give you a brief recap and um, have Brandon walk you through the plans. And then if you have questions for the other team members, um, by all means, we're, we're at your disposal. Um, we're seeking a consistency determination. I'm get rid of this thing on the side of my screen. Um, it? I want to do it. What? application pending for the planning board. Uh, we did first appear before the planning board in September as well. Uh, they made a type two secret determination and referred us to Harbor Coastal for consistency. Um, there were minimal comments, I think, last time we were before you. Um, the reason for the delay, which was alluded to in some of our adjournment requests, was that we are seeking a letter of map amendment from FEMA. Uh, the majority of the property, including where the, the home and structure and, and main structures are located, are above the base flood elevation. 
The property is located in the AE zone with a base flood of uh, 12. And there is a large portion of the property that's at elevation 13. So we've submitted the LOMA. Um, given everything that's going on, FEMA is just a little bit backed up. So we did reach out and our uh, surveyors had a conversation with them yesterday. And we were told 10 days from yesterday should be when we have our final LOMA. Um, so, you know, given that we, we decided it would be best to, to come back before you tonight in hopes that um, if there are no other outstanding questions, a consistency determination could be granted uh, pending the final LOMA, considering we can't get a building permit or a flood floodplain development permit without that. And, and we were issued the preliminary LOMA from FEMA and that was included in our February submission. Uh, so just a, an overview of what we're proposing. Uh, this is an existing single family home that has existing improvements on the lot. We're just seeking to add some amenities um, and also a second story addition that doesn't really impact some of what this commission looks at, but just so that you can get the context of what the homeowners are looking to do. Um, they're trying to put a second story above the garage and add a new pool and some amenities around the pool. Um, they are also actually improving the property from an environmental standpoint um, pretty significantly. They're removing existing patio and decking that is within the wetland buffer and it's impervious. They are replacing some of it with completely pervious materials. And they're also um, going to put in new wetland plantings where the area is just lawn right now. So they're restoring some, some wildlife habitat. And uh, like I said, Bill Kenny and, and his associates can speak to that a little bit more. Um, we're proposing new stormwater management. And um, since we last appeared before you, there were also some minor amendments to the project, which actually improved some of the um, some of the impacts to the wetland buffer or further eliminate any impacts. Um, there is a decrease in impervious coverage that's resulting from uh, a smaller pool cabana that's proposed. Um, there was also a breezeway between the garage and the single family home that's been eliminated and it's actually going to be replaced with a second story bridge, which is pretty cool. Um, so that eliminates uh, a good amount of impervious coverage and it also increases the flood volume storage on site. So the whole project already was proposing a, an increase in flood volume storage, but these amendments further increase that. Um, let's see what else we are. Uh, we did receive an email from Frank Tavalacci yesterday confirming that the whole project is zoning compliant um, with those amendments that we're proposing. The, uh, the law actually currently um, had some side yard setback nonconformities. This project is proposing to cure those. So it's actually really good from a zoning perspective as well. Um, and let's see, we also included in our original submission a letter of no jurisdiction from the Department of Environmental Conservation. And that's because there's an existing seawall on the property and we're not proposing any changes to the seawall. So the DEC confirmed their jurisdiction stops at the seawall. Um, so with that being said, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon just to give you a little bit more detail. And I think he's got a nice rendering for you. And then anything else, uh, feel free to ask, right? Thanks, Brandon. Great. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So again, Brandon Stewart representing Michael Lewis Architects and the owners. Um, and if I'm allowed, it looks like I'm allowed, am I disabled from sharing my screen? Am I able to, to put something up? I think Amber's permissioning you as we speak. Yes, you should be good to go. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, can everyone see the that rendering? All right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, uh, Kristen did a great job of explaining everything that's changed between between uh, the fall and now, um, just to maybe illustrate for you why the Loma is being requested. I can show you the, on the survey. Um, you can see the topo lines from our surveyor indicate that the 12 foot topo line runs 
through here, if you can see where my cursor is, basically running through the rear of the house and the, the garage. And just to orient you, the harbor is, is here at the rear. Um, the actual line on the FEMA maps is way back here, grazing the front of the house um, near the street. And so the reason for the Loma determination is to is to show that 12 foot topo line more correctly where where it is. So uh, as Kristen explained, just to quickly show you graphically on this rendering um, what's changed between our application previously and now. Um, here is the what is currently just a one story garage, which is now becoming a, a garage with a, an office addition on the top of it. Uh, as she mentioned, was previously, um, or is currently, I should say, non-conforming with regards to the side setback. Uh, the, the wall is proposed to be constructed even further in than was proposed before, a full seven inches, uh, which brings it well out of the, the danger zone with regards to the side setback. She mentioned that the cabana has shrunk from where we previously showed it. This is the one-story cabana here with this flat roof and deck on the top. Uh, it's now shrunk and moved away from the from the water's edge by about four feet, um, which also an added uh, benefit to that is the sight lines from the neighbor have now improved from where they were. Um, she mentioned that this breezeway, which was previously proposed to be a two-story structure, um, is now it only exists at the second floor as sort of a breezeway bridge, we're calling it, that connects the two spaces. So um, whereas previously we were taking up some flood, available flood volume with that two-story structure, it's now completely open below. Um, all of these- I wanna just stop you for a second uh, here because I think I can, I just wanna make sure I understand. All of the added interior living space is uh, up off the first floor level, right? Second level of the garage and breezeway. No new interior living space that's at, at the ground level? Um, no, that's not true. The, there is new floor space at the cabana that's at the first floor okay, level. Thank you. And there is also some new first floor space uh, here near the driveway, this small mudroom addition, which is outside of the flood zone and the wetland buffer. Um, and the floor levels of all of the above, of all the first floor proposed spaces are up uh, two, two full feet above the, the BFE, the base flood elevation, as well as this existing, uh, the existing footprint of the, of the family room here, at the first floor, um, which footprint is not proposed to be changed at all. Um, we're also bringing the floor of that space up to comply with that. 14 photo mark as well. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. Great. And um, so, yeah, as uh, and also as explained, all of these improvements here surrounding the pool are proposed to be pervious. Um, we were showing a, a solid fireplace, which was both seaward of the BFE and within the wetland buffer that we were showing you before. That's completely been eliminated from the project. Um, the pool outline and the size and shape of it is exactly the same as well as the location of it. Um, you may remember some conversations before about uh, how sensitive we're, we're trying to be to this, this tree, which is very special, not just for our property, but for the whole, uh, the whole amphitheater of, of the basin here. Um, and lastly, this is a small technical thing, the pool equipment room, which was previously proposed to be completely enclosed and located above the uh, floodplain is now still those things and also further away from the water's edge. It's been pressed back into the garage slightly uh, towards the street. And so uh, with all that, we're, we're just, we're pleased to see the, the initiative of the owners to make all of these uh, improvements uh, in the interim as we waited for the the Loma without coercion from from the architects or or uh, direct pressure from the village we're pleased to see uh, Stephen and Caroline ma making these steps to, to really make the their project fit in with the environment and with the neighborhood uh, and with that if there are any additional questions for 
Michael Stein or for Bill Kenny's office, as Kristen uh, explained, they're both on the line as well. Uh, the the one other thing that I wanted to ask about uh, are the new calculations for flood volume. Mm -hmm. If somebody sure. could just just give me a walk through the math now that now that the breezeway is out and it's changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, on the lower left hand side of the plan that we sent, um, I'll walk you through kind of what's going on here. So you can see this dark orange line represents the 12 foot O uh, base flood elevation line. And so all of the proposed structures that are um, taking up flood volume seaward of that line are highlighted in, in bright colors here. Um, and the, these areas that are sort of hatched with this cross pattern those are the outlines of previous structures which are proposed to be removed. This was a, an existing stone patio which was completely solid um, and that's, that's gone now. And then also you can see some localized excavation required for the pool which is um, increasing available flood volume. The things that are contributing to, and taking away from flood volume are these are simply we're showing some a basic structural layout of the posts proposed to support this deck and we're showing the stair the two stairs as solid objects though they're also proposed to be pervious decking um, and before we were showing some additional um, flood volume being taken away here between the two the principal and accessory structures um, so if you were to look back at our old plans you will see that that we used to be showing flood volume um, being taken away there. Now that that's gone, uh, that is completely, the topo lines are in their completely natural state and there's no impedance of floodwaters uh, between those two structures. And if I remember or, correctly, or the yeah. excavation for the pool causes the, the net cut fill to be negative for the property, for the proposed changes? Uh, yes, that's true. Okay. And <clears throat> I assume this will be the case, but um, the, the net cut fill in the wetland buffer is um, also negative? Uh, yes, that's that's correct. And um, Michael Stein and or Shea can perhaps speak to that a little bit more. Um, in the soil testing that was conducted, they were, I think they were, the results were, were more positive perhaps than we were expecting um, in terms of, of the conditions in this area. Yes, good evening, Michael Stein with Hudson Engineering. Um, and I'm just pulling that up right now. So we we actually got down um, over over eight feet uh, without it, without encountering ground or ledge rock. And we had very positive percolation rates. One hole was 22 inches per hour, one was seven inches per hour. Those are very favorable rates um, for doing infiltration. Okay, Loma drill down calculation of fill volume and net fill. I, uh, I've touched on the issues that, that I knew coming in I needed to talk about. Uh, I'm gonna open it up for other commissioners who have questions, um, starting with Seamus. And, and uh, again, Michael Stein, uh, I would just ask, I, I have to leave for my third meeting tonight um, in a few minutes. So if you have any questions as far as stormwater, um, I, I'm available right now, so. I, I do, so maybe I'll still still go first. Um, I, I think, um, and help me if I missed something in the documentation, but I think the last document we have from Keller Sessions and um, Esteban, it was done by Brian, uh, is back in September 14th, which had um, three open comments uh, that, that I thought we would want to resolve or address. Um, I'll do the, maybe do them in order of importance. So first, it seemed like there was a, a note that the rear system emergency overflow should be sized for larger storm events. That's number one. And then the less important ones in my mind, number two, is, two and three were construction details for the trench drain and driveway asphalt restoration and removing a call tech from the plan that I think is not planned. Um, have those been addressed? We have we have 
uh, the revised drawings that were resubmitted, uh, those issues were addressed. The, de the detail was removed for the Coltec. The, the trench train detail was added on. Um, the, the comment as far as the overflow to the system, it, it basically, it's any, this ha our system handles everything up to the 25 year storm. Anything more than that uh, basically will overflow. It won't be collected in the system, it'll just flow over land. So um, we did add a pop of emitter, but it's, it, again, it just won't be accepted into the system. It will just flow naturally over land. And maybe Esteban, I'll just ask you in a minute to comment on that, because as you guys probably understand, you're helping a very layman here try to understand this. Just I'm just trying to address the comment that's in the record that I don't think we've resolved. So um, Michael, is that is 25 years sort of the the, the standard or, or code level of design? Um, yes. Um, but in this sense, the word overflow, where anything would overflow to is our tidal waters. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not that we could really cause flooding on any other property. Okay. So the, uh, just to read you the comment here, the majority of the piping system will be submerged before the system will overflow. That is, um, something that's expected and can't be improved and doesn't impact neighbors and, and is not no. any worse than the current conditions are all are all those things true there will be less water coming off as well as we're basically providing water quality now so whereas water quality didn't exist from the, the different components plus we're taking in from the storm from the the driveway we're treating the runoff coming from the driveway so we're really doing above and beyond what would really be required and we're actually that is that the driver would really contribute the most as far as contaminants because obviously salts coming off the cars, oils. So that water is now being treated, whereas before it wasn't, and that water ran off into the street where now that's that has been eliminated. Okay. And Esteban, have you have you had a chance to look at this in, in, enough to be able to confirm that you agree that the issues from the September colored sessions? Um, memo and the discussion with Michael just then that, that you'd be satisfied or do you have any issues? Um, I did, I did, I did have a chance to review it. Um, please pardon. I did submit the, the revised, um, my updated memo today to Amber. So I don't know if she had a chance to upload it up to the Nova site. Um, but based on the first work, uh, the first comment, um, based on the submitted material, it didn't seem like, um, comment number one, um, um, I saw that it wasn't updated. Comment two, in terms of the Coltec, uh, the 100 HD Coltec was satisfied. Um, I didn't see the um, the construction trench strain or asphalt restoration detail on there, nor a pop-up emitter for the, or was not illustrated on the plan on the rear, um, unless I had, was, unless, uh, um, Plans, earlier plans were submitted, um, but I didn't see that. Plus, I also had some additional comments um, based off the stormwater report that um, the revised stormwater report that was submitted. Um, right. Uh, if you if I if you could unshare your screen so I could I could share. Sure. And, yeah, and actually, I, and to correct uh, <clears throat> what I had, had said, we didn't put a pop up emitter. We actually there's a drain inlet that that's there that. At that point, once it's once the, the system is full, it, it just do, it doesn't accept any more water, and the water will just flow over, over land. Um, let's see where I can get this. Well, my, Michael, while you while you get oriented there, just for one quick sec, I think I think that comment number one, Esteban, was just that the scheduled construction schedule dates weren't updated. I, I don't personally see that as an issue, but um, I, second, I don't think that. We did get your memo yet, and Amber, I know it, it sounds like it just came in today, but um, if that's something that could be circulated, that'd be helpful. And Michael, I'll hand it, hand it back to you. Just wanted to. Sure. So cool. this this is uh, the, the the last drawing that had been submitted, and so this is the the steel trench drain here that was added in, as well as the pavement restoration um, up here. Um, and I can't remember what the other one. It was the dates on the construction schedule. Um, the the Coltec 100 model detail that we weren't using was removed. Yeah, and that's that. These are both at the 330s yeah. here. The installation for. So, so it, um, unless unless Esteban or anyone chimes in, let's let's not talk about dates. I, I mean, I, I don't think I care about that. But um, 
ticking through the others. So the, the Coltec you are showing is, has been removed or updated to the correct, right? Yep. This is all for the three Coltec 330. Um, <clears throat> and this is for the trench drain here. And he just, uh, that's what I just mentioned, uh, pavement restoration. And so this was our pavement restoration here. Um, I'm not sure what, I'm trying to think. And yeah, that, I think that does cover it other than that, that rear system emergency overflow. Oh, okay. And so here we have the, the, the multiple inlets on this line. So at, as well as this Nile blast, which allows you to clean out the isolation row. Um, these basically, once once the, the, the system's full, these stop collecting the water and it overflows here right down to the seawall. So to add in a, an, another method doesn't necessarily provide any benefit. Can you um, just, um, can you send me those plans? Cause I'm looking at something completely different um, from what I got for, for the last submission. Sure. Yeah, and I, I believe that I'm, I'm, I don't know if Shay's on the line or maybe Michael, you recall, I, Shay sent these plans to you Esteban um, on, on March 8th, which, so they didn't, they weren't part of the official submittal, but I, uh, I understood there was some communication between the two of you so that you, you, you have these um, in your inbox, but yeah, we can resend them. And I do have to sign off. So, um, but Shay will be on the line. Uh, he, he was the engineer in my office working on this. So he knows uh, this very well. Um, but have a great evening, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Thank you for your time. Uh, Shay, can I ask you a quick question about uh, the stormwater? Is Shay on? Oh, let's see. Maybe he didn't raise his hand. Uh, I'm just promoting him to panelists now. Since oh, there we go. Raising his hand. Yeah. I, I just we we just have gotten the updated Kellard Sessions report across, which which I do note has like eight new items that we would need to look through, I think. Jay, you're on mute if you're if you're trying to address the questions. I don't see Shay on Shay, mute. can you hear us? It's Shay Graham, it's S S Graham there. Okay. Yeah, Shay's on mute. I see him now. Shay, can you take yourself off mute? All right, well, I'll just throw it out there. I, I just had a question about stormwater, uh, about quality, if there were if there were any filtration systems. Uh, I haven't seen that plan, um, but that was just one uh, question I had. We're getting a, uh, we're getting a chat from Shay that uh, Shay is on a phone and uh, can't seem to unmute. Am, uh, he suppressed star six. I think maybe his phone needs to be elevated to panelist. I have elevated him to panelist. I, um, Shay, oh, I mean, well, I don't know. What's his phone number? I, I, yeah. is, that, is that the six, seven, five, three? Type the last four. The six, seven, five, three is Dennis. Ah. Uh. Who's four three three or no three three zero, three three zero six I'll seven four. Promote three. them as well. Oh yeah, he just uh, chatted back to us. Eighty one fifty three. Okay. Shay is eighty one fifty three. All right. Well, those were my general concerns. We'll, uh, we can address them later. Doesn't the phone doesn't seem to be working here? He's still on mute. Hello. Oh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Um, my name is uh, Shay Graham from Hudson Engineering. Uh, in regards to six. Uh, 52 short acres. I'm so sorry. Would you be able to repeat that question for me? Yes, Jay. Uh, it's Andrew. I just had a, a question about stormwater quality. Uh, I haven't uh, had a chance to look at those plans, but are there any fil filtration systems incorporated in that stormwater? Yes, correct. Um, 
Because due to the uh, the high perk rates, we actually didn't need a very large system. So rather than having a separate isolation row for water treatment, we actually incorporated it into the entire uh, system, which is why you see isolation row on both the systems. So the entire 25-year uh, storm is being actually treated. And how is it being treated? Um, so the isolation row is actually wrapped in filter fabric which actually filters the water as it's exfiltrating into the ground. Okay. And any maintenance on that? Is that easy to maintain? Is, does it require uh, cleaning of that fabric? Yes, correct. Um, I believe it is, I'm going to look at it right now for you. I believe it's, it, it is every six months that it has to be um, cleaned out. So, uh, which is why the 18-inch uh, diameter nyloplast is there, along with the 12-inch pipe to the isolation row to allow it to be easier to, uh, to be cleaned. Okay, thank you. No problem. While well, Shay's on the line, are there any other questions? Um, Seamus, did you wanna ask anything specifically? Um, Regarding the stormwater, I know you said there there's uh, the memo that you haven't had the chance to review yet from Keller Sessions' office. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what what I feel like is there's you know six or so. Uh, there's a few of these new additions that um, are not going to be problematic. You know, kind of prior to certificate of occupancy, doing certain just. Um, normal course things, but there's um, things related to the HydroCAD model flow and SWIP needing to be updated and incorrect inputs perhaps. So short of Esteban and Shay or Michael who's left having some sort of dialogue that can resolve this point by point, I, 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 I think that this is um, kind of difficult to get this at this point, you know, of the process for tonight's meeting. Um, I'm, I'm just, maybe I'll go back on mute and just read this, but I, I, I do think that there are open items here uh, that are technical in nature. Esteban, I, I guess my question for you would be um, the technicality of those questions. Is that something that can be easily addressed? We, we do have to reappear before the planning board um, in the event that we get it, we get a consistency determination. So um, materials and anything that would be amended would get reviewed by your office and the planning board. Is there, is there anything you see that, that should hold this up? Or do you think that these are all based on what you saw tonight with the amended plans, this is all something that could move forward? Uh, yes, that is correct. A lot of the stuff is just, um, updating, um, CAD, uh, CAD models and, and drawings. So there's nothing that would that technically that would hold up the process so you can continue then, as is. Okay. Uh, that, that would mean making, or sorry, Thomas, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead and finish up your thing because I'm, I'm headed in a different direction. Okay, um, so some of these are model inputs that I assume you put in a model because no one can do in their head what the outcome is. And then <laughs> it would require SWIP updates. So how, how do you sort of, um put in context your your comment there that um because do you agree that the SWIP needs to be updated as far as you can tell here well once the model once the model is updated um they there's probably some numbers within the SWIP that have to that have to be updated so those are just simple text changes uh which don't take long to do um so i think once um hudson engineering and and please pardon i think the the last um the submission that i got um i think I did get those updated plans, but I didn't get them from Amber. I got them from directly from the engineer. Um, so I didn't, some of the, as you see in my memo, they were seen and not addressed. There were older drawings that I had reviewed. Um, but going back to what we were talking about, um, yeah, those are, those are quick changes that, that can occur um, within a couple of days and shouldn't hold up the planning board process at all. And they, would they, would they ever, cause the need to redesign any aspect of the system or the proposed? Uh... No, because I think um, what the, the, the race that they used um, wouldn't cause too much uh, changes or changes to the, to the actual system. It's just, just um, updating their, their uh, 
the CAD model accordingly and making sure that everything coordinates, the plans coordinate with the HydroCAD, with the HydroCAD model and then updating the SWIFT, SWIFT report accordingly. Okay, and then if you, if you, is there a quick way, if you check the date, are you, do you have the plans now that we have in our submission package or is there something additional? Well, I saw, I saw from the, sub, the submission that was given to us uh, uh, by Amber on Friday had plans that were dated, I think 820. And then the ones that Michael Stein showed, I think are more updated. I didn't, uh, I didn't see the revision date on those or it was too small for me to read. Um, but from what he showed, it seems that the first four commons were addressed um, in that in th in that submission. Yeah, because I guess I'm I'm thinking, but someone help me here. Uh, maybe Kristen, you can confirm this. I, I guess our submission package that we're working off of is not the latest plans. So, uh, no, it's it's not. Yeah, that's correct. So so the submission package with the Hudson Engineering drawings. There, there were slight amendments, um, I believe it was March 8th, after Esteban's office talked to Hudson Engineering. With Brian leaving Kellard Sessions, this kind of, you know, got, got lost in the shuffle. And it was something that actually, you know, came to our attention that where's it, where are we at with the Kellard Sessions memo? We submitted everything to Brian. Did he not look at it? Do we need to move things forward? So um, that's, that's the reasoning behind that. Okay, let me, I'll go, uh, that covers all my explicit questions. Let me go on mute. I'm gonna read through this, um, Esteban, what we have from you, but I'll let others chime in with their questions. So thanks. Okay, I'm okay. gonna jump in here because I, I, I think I'm just trying to check a box here, but I, I, recall, I thought I recalled that we had a, a wetland scientist letter with the September submission. And I just looked to make sure I could find it and I couldn't. If you could point me to where that is, that'd be great. You, you do have a uh, tree assessment preservation plan and coastal resource assessment in the September 1st submission, which was exhibit J and K and L of September 1st. So there's three different exhibits for each um, analysis that was done. Yeah, I have the, I have the tree. Okay. Um, but you said J, K, and L. Correct. So, I think what you're looking for specifically might be the might be J and K, the wetlands analysis, and then the coastal resource assessment. Um, having trouble finding that on Novus. It had, we have uh, tree. Um, Carolyn, do you have plan. that? To share your screen. Or give me one second here. So it looks like uh, what's called wetland delineation in Novus. Un, right underneath that is coastal natural resource assessment. Um, the type is labeled backup material. So I was just able to open it. If you can all see my screen, uh, but Carolyn Matthews, I'm an ecologist and arborist with William Kenny Associates. And this is the uh, coastal natural resource assessment we provided. All right, and I, I remember looking at this, uh, you know, several months ago. Let me, if you can, if you can scroll through so I can just remind myself yeah. where this ended up. Let me get you to full screen. Would you like me to provide any analysis on this or do you just want to take a look? Uh, I'm just, I, I, I sort of, I sort of said, I'm looking to check a box. Um, we, we, our operating standard for a very long time has been that if, if, work is going to be done in a wetland buffer, uh, we have to have a wetland scientist telling us that it's not going to have any negative impact on the wetlands. Um, I don't particularly think that that's controversial on this one, but it's a standard that we're, we're very consistent on. So now that we're, we're at the point where we're, you know, we're, we're reviewing the full application and getting ready to vote consistency, I, I wanted to make sure that we, we had that. 
I think what you're looking for is in the last paragraph of the page um, that's on the screen right now, um, that very first sentence um, based on our investigation, review of project documentation and consultation. And it, it concludes the project will not have um, adverse impacts on tidal wetlands among other Third things. from last sentence. Uh, okay. All right. That, that speaks to the standard we've applied. I, that, that was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Ms. Motel, quick question. Uh, who are the neighbors to the right and the left of this property? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, to, so to the right, we have uh, Michael David Tobias, is, which is on the, on the tax rolls, and then the, the Ferrante family to the left, um, which they which currently have a project also underway, which you've probably reviewed as well. Yeah, you know that that's a funny that's a funny situation because we did review and I, and I'm asking because we did review the moving of the Fronte house, but somehow uh, I don't remember, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. We didn't review that construction, and, and it's, it appears that that house is a substantial house. It's got a lot of roof area, and since we didn't review it. Uh, I'm hoping that they're not doing anything right next door that'll have a uh, adverse impact uh, on your project. And uh, we should try to try to get a review. Esteban, can you can you get your hands on that file and see what they're doing about stormwater and, and that large roof? And uh, because I, I don't, does anyone remember reviewing the house? I remember reviewing the, the application to move the, the former house. But did we re did we review that actual new construction? Anyone? What's what's the address on that house? Uh, six six four eight six four eight two eight. Six four. Eight. Candace, you remember that? I have I the same memory as you. I remember the moving of the house. I don't remember plans for the new house. I'm fairly sure uh, Shay can correct me if I'm wrong. I I believe HEC was also working on that property, if I'm not mistaken. But maybe it wasn't Shay. Maybe it was someone else in, in your office. But I do yeah, know one sure. thing, just from from analyzing the the two properties and the street in general. Um, the house in question on our lot is shifted towards the water farther than any of the other surrounding houses. So um, the I remember particularly looking at the pool um, on six the proposed pool on six forty eight. I believe was was healthily outside of the wetland buffer, if I'm not mistaken. I, and I can't speak to the other portions of the proposed work over there, but. Yeah, Commissioner Maggio, I, I would also say that based on um, the evaluation the scientists at Bill Kenny's office did, you know, they were looking at existing conditions um, as recently as, as the summer regarding the, the adjacent properties and evaluating those impacts and um, how that how that would play into what we were proposing on our lot. But I, I understand your question. Yeah, it's just hard to make a determination. I, I don't remember seeing that file. Tom, Thomas, you have any idea? Is there recourse? Can we go back and, well, let's, and look at that? Let, we should probably take that offline. I want to keep the Keep the applicant yeah. move this applicant's issue moving forward as quickly as we can. Uh, we haven't heard anything from either uh, Randy or Lisa. If you've got questions, uh, you're on. And specifically, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. <sighs> All right. So I guess so. I guess the 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 last remaining question of, in terms of, of timing and handling the applications, or two questions is, are there colored session items that are open that would that that need to be closed before we know enough to cast our consistency vote, and are we comfortable casting a consistency vote, uh, conditional on uh, on Loma? Now it, we there's been. Um, there has been significant resistance over the last 
two years to do conditional consistency. And I think where we've arrived at, uh, every commissioner can take their own position on this, but where we've arrived at is that we will do it when we find that it is sufficiently um, objective, uh, identifiable, and um, enforceable that we are comfortable with the conditions and that we won't if they're sort of abstract and slippery. Um, for my part, I, I, I think we understand the Loma issue and either, they're, they, either the preliminary will become a final Loma change in what, something like nine days uh, and they get the permit and move forward uh, or it won't and then they've got a problem that uh, will prevent us from having found anything consistent anyway. Uh, so, uh, speaking for me, I'm not worried about the Loma issue as consistency. I'm 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 comfortable uh, dealing with Loma as a as an open condition. Um, Seamus, I, I want to know where you are on the Kellard Sessions stuff. Is there anything in there that we that really requires? Uh, it's not just updating stuff that really requires us to know what the outcome is. Yeah, I, 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 I think we've been put in a difficult position here because I think this is a good project that I didn't come into this meeting with a lot of questions, you know, no change of volumes, the wetland buffer, no net fill, better wetland planting. Um, I think it's difficult to vote when we don't have the correct plans in our submission. We know that changes need to be made to like hydrocad modeling and the SWIP needs to be updated. Um, I don't think, but I'm not an expert in that and I, and I take Esteban's um, input which i'm weighing i i don't see that being a problem i wonder if there's a way to get those things uh fixed before voting consistency um so that's that really my only challenge is what i think is not going to be a problematic hurdle um but that list of things open swip incorrect model inputs and incorrect plans um is is difficult in in many cases you know you you <laughs> You wouldn't want to vote on that basis. So um, that's that's what I'm weighing here as I skim this. And am I incorrect in, in my understanding that the that Keller Sessions is, is also involved during the planning board review that comes after this? Yeah. Um, and we'll, I, yeah, I think what, what Seamus's concern is um, is whether or not the project is going to change based on addressing the Keller session mm -hmm. comments. I think what Shay has has commented on and what Esteban seems to have opined on as well is that no, this is just kind of like a document modeling update. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Shay, and I, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth. I want to understand this just as well as um, the commissioners do. But it, that is my understanding that this is a document update, not so much a project update to respond to these comments. Correct. I, I would agree with that statement. Um, I think the issue or the, the numbers that you're seeing that aren't matching up, I think it's it's the not seeing the updated plans. Um, those calculations might have gone through, but the, the stormwater narrative has also been updated per the revisions to the plan. So I think once we coordinate that with you, um, I think this issue should be resolved very, very quickly. I guess what I'm sort of putting out there is whether um, anybody wants to suggest something that allows all of this to be fixed prior to a vote, whether that's time or otherwise, or whether there's a condition that's workable for us, uh, or whether we just want to vote it as is, which of course we can do. Uh, so well, that's 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 what I'm yeah trying to. Sure, let me stop you a second because it, it, it there's one more thing we haven't done, which is open this to public comment. Uh, we're uh, we're always appreciative of, of our fellow vi village residents who, who pay attention to the work of the land use boards. Uh, we do have to open it to public comment before there's a consistency vote. So uh, I guess let's do that and see what comes up, if anything. So at this time, Amber, if we've got anybody uh, on the line who wishes to speak, uh, they can be heard. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Yes. Tekert. Good evening. Um, as I understand,
standard, the stormwater design manual on infiltration systems requires pretreatment based on the infiltration rates. Has that been accounted for in the design? Yes, it has been accounted for in the design. Um, based on it, what it, we, I'm sorry, is it shown on the plan? Um, the rates, no, that's shown in the stormwater no, narrative. No, I'm sorry. The pretreatment is the pretreatment volume shown on the plan. I see. Um, so the treat the pretreatment volume is actually met based on the size of the system, which is represented by the system shown on the plan in the rear and front of the house that say isolation row. Okay, so the system is sized to hold 50% more than the 25 year rain event or more? What is the infiltration rate you're using? So the infiltration rate that I'm using is, uh, let me look up the, um, give me one second, let me just go thanks. Uh, So based on the infiltration rates that we had, as we said before, um, they were very high. We got a uh, 22 and seven. Um, because of the high infiltration rates, um, the water that pours into, uh, we, we're required to capture the water quality volume, which I, is I under, one I, point. I understand. I, the question is what percolation or infiltration rate are you utilizing to design your system? Okay, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. Uh, give me one second. I'm just pulling it up. We used a percolation rate of 10 inches and a percolation of four inches. Okay, so on the 10 inch, so you have two different um, sections of Coltex? Correct. So on the 10 inch, I'm sorry, 10 um, inches an hour section, your volume of storage is double the required volume for the 25 year storm event? Because that's what I believe the treat pretreatment requires is 100% of the water quality volume in pretreatment. Isn't that correct? Correct, which we are, uh, which we are satisfying. The water, con well, the water quality volume is actually 1.65 inches, um, and these isolation rolls are able to hold um, the volume for the water quality volume without exfiltration. Twice the water quality volume, right? No, no, it's just 100% of the water quality volume. Why is it only 100%? Um, because based on DEC standards, that's what we're required to do. 100% of the water quality volume and 100% of the runoff reduction volume. Um, we're required to do 50% of the runoff reduction volume when uh, we're uh, repurposing the impervious area, if it's redeveloped area. I'm sorry. Am I incorrect that if you are infiltrating through Coltex, that if you have an infiltration rate of over eight inches an hour, you need to provide 100% pretreatment volume as you're providing for the actual treatment. So I'm not understanding what volume you're treating, but if it's all in the plans, I will look at them, but I hope, you know, the board gets advised whether there's actually pretreatment being accounted for here. Thanks. Uh, yes, just to uh, follow up with that, um, pretreatment is being um, provided for the system. That is the use of the isolation rail. The entire system is actually pretreatment. So it's actually treating the entire uh, 25, up to the 25 year storm event. Um, and we're only required to treat the water quality volume. 
I understand, but you're required to provide 100% of the water quality volume in pre-treatment. So if you're saying you're pre-treating it all, all in the same set of cultex, you need twice the volume, as I understand it. But Esteban can advise the board. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks. One Good. comment I may add, one of one of the two isolation rows that's to treat the driveway um, is actually we're not proposing any modifications to the driveway. That was something that I think HEC uh, just did for the improvement of the site. Um, that in, entire treatment of that water, I mean, technically without us proposing any modifications there, I think maybe technically not even be required, but it's, it's good to see that that whole system is there. Thanks very much for your thoughtful comments and questions, Mr. Tickert. Uh, Esteban, I, I want to I want to make sure I understood what I just heard uh, about the about the volume that needs to be pretreated. Is there does this system as it's currently proposed have enough uh, have enough pretreatment volume to satisfy the applicable standard? Yes, um, based off um, my understanding um, of how the systems is, are designed, the isolation row provides free treatment um, for the system. Um, in this case, they are using uh, the isolation row does provide free treatment as well as provide storage uh, for the water quality volume and the runoff reduction volume as well. Does it have to be the, the, the premise of the question was that it has to be 100% above the 25 year uh, event. Is that right? Does it only have to be 100% or does it have to be 200%? 25 year event plus 100? No, it only has to be up to the 100% the of the 25 year storm. I don't know, it doesn't have to be double. Okay. And the, the system that you just described is okay to do double duty, which is it sounds like the gist of that question, which is that it's doing two things to satisfy the requirements. Yes, that is correct. Okay, and that's that's acceptable that the whole the whole system is itself pretreatment. Yeah. In in normal cases and in, in you um in, in normal cases, you would have extra units to, to store the rest of your uh, volume. But in this case, because um, the, the infiltration rates are favorable, um, only one um, row of Coltec units are, are necessary to satisfy the water quality volume pretreatment and um, uh, hold, the, up, up, hold the flows up to the 25 year storm. Okay. All right. So um, we, and I think. Chairman. I just have a quick comment. I've had a chance to look at the uh, memo of today's date um, from Esteban, and it does strike me that the comments are all what I think could be fairly characterized as ministerial and things that could be, um, you know, updated. Um, and I think we've, if I heard correctly from Esteban, that that's really something that uh, isn't really, from his perspective, an issue. Is the person who wrote the memo? Is that a fair characterization of what we've heard, Esteban? I think that question is to you. Yeah, it's there. There are minor. There, there should be minor changes that Hudson engineers should be able to take care of fairly quickly and and issue a new set of plans and a new uh, updated revised uh, SWIP um, to satisfy all the comments. Okay, Esteban, let, let me just ask it the plain way. In your mind, is there any chance that that satisfying these comments is going to require a material change to the stormwater treatment that we're considering right now? No. All right. It, well put. It, it's it's not my call whether we have enough information. It's the board's call. So my my every time straw poll, 
do you think you have enough information to make your determination about consistency? Seamus? Um, I, I don't like the state of these things. I'm not hearing the applicant putting forward any, you know, plan they'd like to do. Um, so um, I, I guess the information that I think I'm missing is just a complete package, including the right drawings uh, with a closed Kellard Sessions report in writing. Uh, Randy? I do. I do think that we have sufficient information. Okay, Lisa? Yeah, I feel like I agree with Seamus that we want a whole closed package. Andrew? Yeah, I just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I just like to have an opportunity to take a closer look at those plans. Uh, some of that stuff I didn't really look at, but um, I think that, um, I think we're on the right track. Are, are you are you polling for a vote now? I the, I mean, the, it, it's the straw poll question. Do you have enough information to cast your vote now, or do you think you need more information to vote consistency? And we've got we've we've got two commissioners so far who think that we don't have a completely closed record. Um, so if yeah, I, to an, to answer it really simply and quickly, I, I just wouldn't feel comfortable. Uh, voting uh, tonight, uh, and we, of course, we want to move this along. I would just like an op, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the file. I'd just like an opportunity to look at those most recent plans um, that uh, were either submitted or not submitted. But I just want to see the most recent, have an opportunity to inspect the most recent plans. I always come into a night hoping that we're going to have a have a two touch application that we review preliminarily and then see again vote consistency. Uh, I'm always disappointed when that doesn't happen. Um, we are, I think, by the best information you have, Ms. Motel, we are now nine days from being final on Loma, which would require, which uh, which would allow us to to dispense with conditional, and it sounds to me like. All the concerns uh, that have been raised uh, are going to be very quick to address. I know you want to vote, and I would like to get this thing to the consistency vote as quickly as possible. Um, if this can if this can happen fast enough, it might even be possible for us to to do something. I my, my fellow commissioners will probably be annoyed at me for for suggesting this, but if it all comes together quickly enough, we might be able to do something on the schedule to accelerate it if it would permit them to make the next um, planning date. I was gonna we say- have a closed record and we wanna vote it. Right. Are you are you thinking like to review it at your work session in April? So it's a week earlier than your meeting or are you thinking a special meeting prior to that? Either of those are things that we could do at, at our discretion. The commission is always free to set its own schedule. And if we if we knew that we had all the information done and this record was locked down and everybody had the information for a vote, um, you know, we could we could do either of those things. We can. There's no reason we can't convert our work session into a um, into a full meeting so that we could get one applicant voted in time for planning. We don't want to hold them up. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my only comment there is that the April um, 15th planning board meeting has a, or April 14th, I'm sorry, has a deadline of March 24th, which is next week. Um, so, you know, we, we were obviously hoping to be able to be on um, on that meeting, but if we could get on the later meeting in April, um, the deadline for that is April 7th. So, I guess is if the work session is, you know, like you usually do, I believe the first Tuesday of the month. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And if, if, if planning is willing to work with us on, on your submission deadline or something, uh, we'll be as flexible as we can. Uh, but it's up, to, it, but it's up to the commission, whether they, they believe the application is final enough to vote on and they are where they are. I understand. Thank you. We're, we're going to, uh, very expeditiously amend our materials and turn them back around to the commissioners so that there are no outstanding 
concerns about stormwater. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I think we've taken this as far as we can tonight. Um, and I hope to see you again very soon. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Have a good night. Thank you all. Good night. Okay, and our second applicant item up tonight is 1025 Rushmore, the Orienta uh, Beach Club application. And in case we hadn't been clear from the, our proceeding, we've we closed the public meeting on. <laughs> on 652. Good evening, Mr. Spatz. Good evening, Commissioner and members of the HZZM board. How are you all doing this evening? Uh, we are actually just waiting. I know uh, Amber's working fiercely to elevate. We have about seven different members, uh, but uh, I'm hoping to be that two touch case tonight. Uh, I think I'm, I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling good. St. Patrick's Day. We had spring-like weather last week. We're talking outdoor patio here, hamburgers, hot dogs. So I'm thinking, I'm, think, I'm feeling good, uh, Chair Burt. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's on board. Let's see. I'm just trying to see. Do we have, um, so I definitely need Nunzio, Richard Horseman, and Alan Pilch. Just want to make sure we have everybody. Okay. I think we do. We have uh, Mark. Hello. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Andrew Spatz for the applicant, uh, Orient the Beach Club. I don't think I need to go back too far uh, as we last appeared before you on January 20th. Um, there are about four points that uh, you requested that we expand upon and clarify. And I'm pleased to say that, um, and I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to review, there was a letter dated February 23rd from Mastro Giacomo Engineering PC, which addressed the use of um, paver systems, the pervious and impervious surfaces. Um, and we, they broke it down into the environmental, practicality, and economics. Um, as well as recommendation that the installation should be impervious together with the stormwater system. Um, and uh, Chair, I know that was something that you, I, I put 19 stars around that about not just saying, oh, you know what, we just want to do impervious. Uh, so in a few moments, Nunzio can take you through exactly why the environmental practicality and economics would speak loudly towards the impervious um, system. I'm uh, gonna, so uh, I'm, I'm going to stop you there, not because I don't understand you, but because, you know, these these meetings are also guidance for other applicants and for sure. citizens to understand what we do. Um, we don't do economics here. <laughs> You, as a representing an applicant, of course, you, your applicant has to think about what things cost, but we do consistency with policies. And I understand, Chair. I, I, I think the economics, and again, I, I spoke. They're important for you. They're not important for us. But it goes to the the functionality in terms of why it would be, it would be, it wouldn't be, it'd be the practicalities of it would not dictate using imper, uh, pervious versus impervious. But I'm going to. I don't want to steal the thunder and the lightning from my consultants because they get paid a lot more than I do, Chair. So um, I, I'm going to let them get in there. Uh, so we talked with the letter also spoke about the terrace and walkway encroachments uh, to the wetland buffers and address the the, the fill. Um, Alan and, and uh, Nunzio will also um, address those issues. And I, I we do have a new member to the team. That's Alan Pilch from ALP Engineering and Landscaping Architecture because the Commissioners want an input from a, a scientific engineer. And uh, we have that individual, Alan is, where's Alan? He's there somewhere right on this. Uh, there he is, he's waving right front and center. Um, you know, commissioners, I think I wanna host a game show after I'm doing all this Zoom stuff because when you're pointing to people and uh, I don't know, I, I think that may after this career. Um, we also provided an aerial map 
for the sight line. That was one of the questions that was raised about whether or not this property can be seen from Harbor Island. Um, and do you also address any other additional permits? We also have Alan Pilch's very extensive uh, detailed narrative with regards to the stormwater runoff mitigation, erosion and sediment uh, control plan mitigation, and tidal wetland permitting. And I believe that once these individuals are done speaking with you this evening, we will be able to arrive at a determination of consistency. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton over to Alan and uh, Nunzio, but chair, if you or any of the commissioners have questions, we'll entertain your questions. I'm not shy about my question. I know that. You know by now. Absolutely. And I do want to point out one thing. There was a question that was raised, um, and Alan and Nunzio will deal with that. That had to do with the map. And I, I know that was something that was discussed with the team earlier this afternoon, and they will dive into that. So. I think, you know, I, so I, you, you have addressed the, the stuff that we talked about last time. Uh, I will, I will tell you, cause it, it moves quicker when we're transparent about what our concerns are uh, coming in. There's two things that I know I'm going to, well, three things I know I'm going to want to talk about. Sure. Um, one is um, the, the map and where the wetland buffer actually is and the, this uh, the difference between DC uh, mm -hmm. Uh, jurisdiction line right i want to i want to hear what you have to say about that i want to hear about cut fill because there was a, a cut fill table that i was um confused by in a lot of our discussion last time and um and uh and i want to talk about how we're we're checking the 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 requirement that we have that if we're we've got somebody doing work in a wetland buffer that we have the opinion of of a scientist that says that it's uh, not going to have any negative impact on the wetlands so that that's that's my whole checklist Those I love are it names. I love it and Alan is here ready to he's I, he's I see he's sitting at the edge of the seat ready to jump in on this so Alan go for it oh you're on mute. He's so persuasive. He's persuasive even on mute. <laughs> Alan, go ahead. You got to unmute yourself. All right. Now I unmuted myself. Good evening. Great. Alan Pilch, LP Engineering. Um, so with regard to the question of the wetland buffer, um, because there is a seawall along the, uh, I'll call it the, along the sound, um, and the elevations on the landward side of the seawall are above 10 feet in elevation. Because of that, the DEC jurisdiction ends at the seawall. The DEC does not uh, regulate a 100 foot buffer beyond that seawall. If the ground surface beyond the seawall was under 10 feet, then they would regulate the 100 foot buffer. But because it's above 10 feet, they don't. So the DEC jurisdiction, as I say, ends right at the seawall. So if the question was, is there a need for a tidal wetland permit from the New York State DEC, and therefore an application for a joint application for permit from you know, DEC Army Corps, the answer is no, it, it isn't in this case. And so then the question becomes whether or not the village regulates the buffer, although the DEC jurisdiction ends at the seawall. And that's, I guess, the question that, um, you know, you can answer, you know, uh, that's how you've interpreted it. Some municipalities actually do regulate it, but I'll leave it for you. So if it is, no, if it I, is well, the village all. doesn't, then, then there is no specific wetland buffer impact on this project. That I think may be a Charlie question, actually. Um, I'm sorry to catch you cold, but I, I'm i not sure I'm right about this, but I don't, but I think that is a difference between the, between the definition of, of uh, regulated wetlands between DEC and the village. I don't think, I don't think the seawall um, prevents us from recognizing a buffer. Am I wrong about that? No, I, I believe you're correct, and I'll have to take a closer look at the villages, you know, the village regulation with respect to this application. Um, you know, his, he, Mr. Pilch was noting the DEC jurisdiction. That's wholly separate and distinct from the village's jurisdiction. 
Yeah. So I, I think we're still dealing with wetland buffer issues. Uh, when we first uh, when we first spoke about this application, uh, it we it wasn't clear that any of this is in the buffer. Now there's there's stuff being there's there's disturbed area within the buffer. So our requirement has been for my entire time on this commission uh, that we have an opinion from a scientist that the work done in the buffer will not do uh, any harm to the wetland that that buffer protects. Now I I it seems intuitive to me that with a seawall between the between the the grassy area that the beach club backs to and the sound it's not particularly a, a, a major concern but it's a requirement we've imposed on everybody no matter how small the amount of work they want to do when the buffer is um, i don't imagine it's gonna be hard to do but it's not something that I think the commission is is of a mind to back off and 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 get loosey goosey about. And I, uh, I that was addressed. I and, and and chair, I'm sorry. I, I believe in the February twenty third, twenty twenty one report, uh, the stormwater runoff mitigation in within the. Just want to see about with regards to the buffer. Alan, did, did uh, the report did address on the last page? On the last page, yes. Okay. Where, where right. title wetland permit? Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Pilch, that's that's your report. Yes, it is. Yeah, I I reviewed it, um, and I think uh, we had somebody reach out for a resume. Uh, your can can you run through your credentials? I understood you to be an engineer. I'm an engineer and a landscape architect. I okay, that, yeah, engineers. that's what I thought I read. Engineer and landscape architect. Correct. Do you have and any? I've actually appeared before this uh, board a couple of years ago. Um, just so you know. Hmm. I um, I don't remember it, but I don't doubt it. Um, I have uh, now. Do you have a Do you have a certification as a professional wetland scientist or as an ecologist? Uh, I do not have that specifically. That being said, I will just tell you that I have a, a long working relationship with a professional wetland scientist, uh, you know, where I was employed. But that being said, I know the regulation with regard to wetlands and wetland buffers. Yeah, I, you know, um, what I'm posing is not a regulation question. Right. What we do here, and, and you know, as, as you've said, you've appeared before this commission before. What we do is policies, and some of our policies have a, interpretive gloss on them. When somebody comes before us and they're going to do work in the 100 foot buffer, uh, they have a scientist tell us that there's going to be, in their professional opinion as a scientist, no negative impact on the wetlands from the work performed in the buffer. Um, I, well, that, that, that being said, I will say that I have about 35 years of experience doing stormwater management work, and I do an enormous number of stormwater pollution prevention plan reports, both inside and outside the New York City water supply watershed. So I do have a, a lot of experience dealing with environmental impacts from stormwater management on projects. I just want to make that clear that, uh, you know, this has been the, the work I've done since Oh, goodness sakes, must be the mid 80s. You know, Don't doubt your experience. Right I've got, I, okay. All right. I, I understand your resume. I understand the conclusion you've drawn. Um, the wetland buffer. Uh, does someone now is the is all of the disturbed area within the wetland buffer only as measured from the seawall or is it, it within 100 foot of a beach area? I think I'll let Nunzio answer that. It's uh, I, uh, good evening. It's from the uh, 100 foot setback line, the uh, tidal wetland line. Right. I, I, I understand that. I, I had a slightly different question. Is all of the 100 foot setback line that covers the disturbed area from seawall or is some of it from beach? It's on the on the survey, the updated survey that was submitted, based on the uh, 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 water level for for tidal uh, tidal wetland. 
that's where we took it from. In other words, on this, the 2020 survey, it showed that line coming across in front of the seawall. That's where that dimension was taken, not from the seawall. Would it be helpful? I'm sorry, Chair, I don't want to interject. It would be helpful to bring up the share. Uh, yeah, well, it, that's that's. I was trying to I was trying to shortcut having somebody um, screen share. I, just, if I knew how to I do looked it, at I it. Sure. I want to take another look at it. Uh, let me let me grab the survey. Hold on a second. I have to get my kids out of full-time school here to be my tech support here. I think that's what it comes down to it, Chair. Otherwise, I would do it. <laughs> Uh, is this, can you see the screen? Is it being shared? It is not. Okay. I think you're enabled. I think uh, Amber enabled everybody. Yeah, there you go. There, there it is. All right, so here I'm gonna, I don't know if you could see the, the crosshairs here. It's labeled title wetland line. Yep. Okay. And you can see over here it says stone stone retaining wall. That's the seawall. Yep. Right there. So the the hundred foot title, I mean it's very close to the to the well, the wall, the, the limits of the wall, but from the target mark here over to that dash title wetlands line is the hundred feet. So here at the bottom you can see it's hundred and ten feet. Then it gets closer, um, and the <clears throat> the closest point is right here, which is existing already, 65 feet to that tidal wetlands line. What we're doing is not going to go any closer than that 65 feet. Yeah. Okay. Is this the typical way that we establish the wetland line um, through a survey versus through like I know there's flagging or um, that, that can that happens sometimes well this is based on the mean high water level for long island sound and that information and the su surveyor uh you know puts it on the map and basically references it back to the actual property just like the the uh um, the seawall and the property line yeah and I'm, I'm just wondering if that's the right definition for the wetland line or not well, it refers to the hundred foot from the tidal wetland, and I guess the the uh, the caveat there is what uh, was discussed with the with the seawall. If there's a structure on the land side with the DEC regulations, not necessarily the local regulation. Tidal as distinct from freshwater. We often right. We often have um, we often have uh, flagged wetlands where uh, the definition is based on um hydric soils or uh or plants yeah basically a field survey you know where you have person go in there and based on the plantings and, and whatnot make a determination and flag it out it sounds like preface if we could just preface the the um where you see the patio the concrete patio when it, when it bends out chair and commissioners that's existing so i i just want to emphasize that we're not bumping anything out so it, 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 the areas of increase are actually along the, uh, the side. So let's just say north-south, uh, where you see B1, B2, A2, and then the step, the little, th those are the areas where we're actually increasing. So as is right now, the concrete patio is there. I just want to remind yeah, everyone the, uh, of that. On the, on the south side, uh, where area A is, that's pretty much out of, out of the 100 foot setback exactly this whole area here there's a little bit of a wedge right here that that is, is in it very very negligible and then it, it blends into the old i can't even see my marker here it blends into the old um into the old to the existing patio then it it widens out a little bit here where the stairs are and we did relocate the wall closer absolutely to the planting bed and this area, if you see here, it's it, existing uh, is 79, and to the new is going to project out about uh, what is it, six and a half feet? 
six and a half at, at this at this point but this is at the higher h higher elevation anyway um but like i said nothing's going to be any closer than that 65 72.5 is you know it's probably 70 feet is about the closest it's going to be anything new understood okay so i think i i understand where we are with with work in the buffer and i i understand where we are on opinion with it um i have in 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 my time on this commission i have not voted consistency on work within a wetland buffer without the opinion of a scientist that the buffer that the work in the buffer however small and however minimally it's in the buffer will not negatively impact the wetlands i uh, i've always believed that that's the record i need under 44 and i'm being as transparent with you as possible about you know what how i think about the policy um there's there's a couple of ways we could deal with that, but one way or another. Look, when there's when I have a concern, tell an applicant what it is, and the concern gets addressed one of two ways: either I get more information that convinces me it's not a concern, or something about the application changes that takes concern out of play. I think I know what piece of information I need to resolve this concern, and it's the same piece of information I've needed from every applicant that's doing work within the hundred foot buffer but it's something that we've been extremely consistent about that we just don't have a lot of flexibility on. Um, there are ways to handle that and, and we can keep moving. The other thing that was on my list that I gave you a few minutes ago that we needed to go over um, tonight that I know I need to know is about the cut fill table. I, I can get that, this drawing here, I guess we're talking about, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. So basically, this is a little bigger scale. You can see the the re, the um, the uh, relocated walkway here. We put it closer to the planting bed. Um, the the uh, again the, the stone masonry rule. I'm, I'm overlaying the existing onto the proposed, which is basically hatched. So mm -hmm. the uh, the this this level here, if, if we look at the uh, at the S drawings, I think it's SP3, where it has the actual final elevations. This is being cut lower, about eight inches or so. You know, on an average, six to twelve inches, so about eight inches on average. So we're cutting, and that's where the negative number comes in on the lower patio as a cut. Okay, the fill. This is the hundred foot setback line right here. So we gave you the fill in that hundred foot setback, just to raise the, uh, just to raise the uh, uh, upper, di you know, upper dining area, the, the roofed over dining area. So that's a plus. And then the other plus is basically the 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 planting area. That's about four to five feet wide. That's coming across here, and then blending up into this existing grade. So when you put all of that together, when you tabulate these numbers, you got area A3 is actually, let me just find it here. <clears throat> area A3 is a cut, which is a negative 37 yards. Um, area A1 is 1.2 yards, which is that little sliver to the south. Area A2 is, is where we're doing the the most projection into that 100 foot buffer. And that's that uh, cubic yardage is 11.8 yards. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're uh, putting a curb at the bottom and basically creating that planting bed so as to keep a, a fairly decent slope for the plantings. Um, so when you, when you account for all of that, the fill that's required to do that planting area is, what is it, 33.3 .3 cubic yards. So the net increase in, in, in what we need to bring in between topsoil is uh, basically 28.7 yards. I don't know if that helps explain it a little better. Well, it does help explain it. Um, it's okay. Uh, so what I'm looking at now is uh, something that is 
180 degrees different from the conversation that we had last time when um, one, of, one of the first things that came up, um, and it wasn't surprising because uh, I assume somebody had been watching the prior application where it's also a major issue, whether there was a net fill in a floodplain. And the answer I got was no. So when I, when I saw the submission for this meeting and saw this table, I wanted to make sure I understood it right because what I thought I understood about this project from the last meeting was that there was no net fill, but there is net fill. You um, see my problem. Yeah, I don't know if that's what, what we we said directly about that. I, I don't think we had the, the, the answer. We knew it was gonna be close, you know, 20, 20 yards is not an extensive number, obviously in a, in, in a wetland buffer or whatever, I guess there's more concern, but uh, I don't know if we ever made a commitment that it was gonna be zero. We we're gonna try to get it to zero, but as far as doing the planting area, the majority you'll see is, is actually, if we didn't do the planting bed and we built a, a, a curb wall like it exists now, then we wouldn't have it, we wouldn't have the fill, but then again, aesthetically I don't know you know what that would look like but like I said 33 of the yards is 33 cubic yards of the fill is strictly that planting area so if anyone who has followed this commission for the past couple of years um, I think would recognize that uh, net fill in floodplains has become a bit of a flashpoint. Um, that's a real problem. I have not voted consistency for an application that had net fill within the floodplain itself or that had net fill within a wetland buffer. I've, I think I voted consistency once for a, for a property that had some had some fill on a property that also had floodplain on it but not in the floodplain. Um, I, we don't for, you can't even do it under code at all in an area that's a riverine floodplain. There's, it's not an ironclad rule under the code in the same way, but we have a no net fill rule. It's got a little more flexibility under the code maybe for coastal floodplain than it does for riverine, but that's a real sticking point for consistency because when we think about our policy 11 and our obligation to keep development and people and property out of harm's way in flood zones, we look at that and say, if you have to if you have to net fill your property to do your project it's probably not consistent that's been a real sticking point and that's why one of the first questions i asked last time we talked about this project was whether there was any net fill and it's it's a it's an easy thing to have a sigh of relief about when we get a representation no there's no net fill uh, and uh and, and mr petrosanti it, it wasn't you that said it but I, I don't mean to make you personally defensive, but the conversation we had was, you'd be glad to know there's no net fill. And I was glad to know there was no net fill. There is net fill. When I have a concern, there's one of two ways it gets addressed. Either I need a bunch more information that resolves the concern, or I need to change to a, to a project that resolves the concern you're going to have a hard time coming up with information that convinces me that my stance on net fill in a floodplain is not a concern. I'm just telling you. Gary, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same policy. This is policy number 11, which makes reference to buildings and other structures will be sited in coastal areas so as to minimize damage to property and endangering of human lives caused by flooding and erosion. Yes, we're talking about the same one. Right. So I just, I, I, and I just want so I, to understand: is that a policy that is of HCZM, or is it a policy? Is it an individual policy? Just so I understand. 
Well, policy 11 is in well, the LWRP. It's written in the LWRP. I have it right here. So and, I'm, I'm right. just trying to understand in terms of, okay, because what, what, what we're talking about here is an, exist, an existing patio. And what they're doing is, I, I believe that the net increase is... I'm, I'm sorry, Nunzio. What, what what was the? I'm 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 trying to 690, look here. 690, 692 square. Well, I know that's the area, yards. but what the fill? Well, let's talk well, about. It's, it's 28.7 cubic yards. 28.7 cubic yards, and when we're talking about the the size of the property, the lot. I I mean that's why I'm just I I understand. Most of the applications that are coming before this very distinguished board are residential when it comes to ocean, uh, beachfront. So, so when we even think about river, because we're, not, we're nowhere near a river, like the Shell Drake of the Maronic River. We're, we're, we're talking about this, the Long Island Sound. And the, the size of our property is, I, I mean, Mark, Elo, what's, what's how many acres are, are, are are we are we talking about at Oriental Beach Club? I think Off it's about eight and a half acres or something. Okay, so eight and a half acres roughly, Chair, and we're talking about twenty-eight cubic yards on a eight acre lot. So I I, I I'm saying this for a point because I understand the policy or not the policy, but the policy is written. I understand the position that individuals on HZM may take. But this is not your typical sort of residential R20 or R5. I mean, this is, you know, so I think that this is a little bit different than other applications, especially when you're talking in comparison to policy number 11, which is to minimize damage to property endangering human lives caused by flooding erosion. I don't think that that is a scenario at all in, in this particular situation. This is one of the areas where we have been most prophylactic in our thinking in, in, in the sense that we have to be, we, we live, our, our determinations either hold up or don't hold up based on, based on the consistency with which we, we apply our thinking. So I, I can, I, I guess on this, I'll just speak for myself as, as, as one vote on the commission. I have been, I have been extremely vigilant to not have uh, applicants net fill in a floodplain because I think when you start letting applicants net fill in floodplains and say, well, in this particular case, it's it's not actually going to get anybody, you know, cut off from egress. Uh, you end up creating an opportunity for most most applicants to say, I can I can convince you that I can net fill and still do my project. I think the only thing that we do on this commission that's actually life or death is floodplain safety. Everything else has value, certainly. If we, if we find something consistent where somebody harms a wetland or a significant habitat, we lose environmental services. And if we let somebody destroy something that's a, a, a piece of historic property or an archeological site, we lose something we can't get back. But the only thing that we could do that would actually get somebody killed is let people develop something they shouldn't develop in a, in a floodplain. And for that reason, we, if, if, it, if it seems overly vigilant on that issue, I'm willing to be overly vigilant. We have said no to, to net fill in floodplains really, really consistently. And I thought we didn't have this issue until I got the plans for this meeting, because last time I came out of our discussion with uh, what I thought was clear message, there was no net fill in this project. And, that's, and now that's not the plan I'm looking at. And I've got something that I've been extremely consistent about. And now I'm, you know, and now I'm being asked to vote consistency on a project that contains an element that I've never permitted. So that's where I'm at. Okay, and then Chair, I, I'm only to protect the integrity of the record. I, I just want to make it clear that I, I, this is not about, and I don't think we should talk about. Let me let me take a step back. When you're considering an application, the application speaks for itself, and. 
I understand there, there there's the LWRP, which establishes the policy that a commission must, you know, which they seek to comply and enforce and make sure there's consistency. And then there's individual policy. And I, 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 I just say that, okay, because we haven't done this in the past, we can't do it today. I, I, I'm a little bit, that's where I'm a little bit lost because in this situation, we're talking about an eight, eight acre lot with 28.7 cubic feet. And you look at, okay, we're talking about A2, the north little walkway here. If someone could explain to me how that could kill someone or cause damage or injury or the likelihood of injury, then I, I you know, totally, I can't disagree with you. I mean, I've sat in, on boards and committees as well, looking, you know, with flood mitigation and always looking out for that. But no two projects are alike. And in this situation, I think we have to look at, okay, are people planning on living or, you know, making this a permanent habit, you know, occupying this, you know, so I think we have to look at the context of what's the intended use. In itself, the club is deemed consistent by your own LWRP, but just by virtue of being a beach club. So I, I, again, I, I mean, we don't need to, I don't want to get bogged down on this, but it, it's concerning because you know, if, if now maybe our consultants can say, well, maybe it doesn't have to be 28, seven point uh, cubic yards. I don't know. I'm not, that's certainly not my job, but what my job is I'm tasked with is to try to effectuate and, and proceed with an application that in, in the scheme of things is absolutely minor. It's a minor increase of what is existing now with a, a, a very well detailed stormwater retention system which where none currently exists. So I, I, I would hate to get hung up on a, a you know, 28.7 cubic yards on a eight uh, acre lot. But again, I, I don't want to, again, Chair, I don't want to, it wouldn't be fair to get bogged down on this one very point, which is, a, I'm sure, other questions and suggestions and ideas. And that doesn't mean that we can't get consistency. consistency. I respect your point of view, but I would just beg of the commission as a whole say, okay, well, let's not treat every project alike. Just because you haven't before doesn't mean that there's a situation that arises where, okay, in this situation, that wouldn't rise to the occasion of causing harm or jeopardy uh, to life, safety, and property. All right. I, I understand your point. Um, I, I've i gone through the issues that I knew coming in I needed to talk about, and um, I think at least I understand where the application is on those. I'm going to open it up to other commissioners. Um, Seamus. Thanks. Um, yeah. So first of all, we're going to have the same issue here that we had on a prior applicant, unfortunately, which is we got a Kelly sessions memo just today with a number of open items um, related to confirming that the plan demonstrates an infiltration system to mitigate the 25 year storm. Um, site plan notes uh, limits of disturbance um, discrepancies. And so I hopefully you guys will get that memo, but there's uh, nine items on here. I think they're all open. Um, and then I think that, um, let me just check quickly, other than that, which I think needs to be probably responded to by the applicant and then confirmed by Kellard Sessions. Um, I think the sequence that I just heard that would be helpful to just lay out very clearly for us to understand would be one, I, I think that, I, I, I don't feel like I know. I, I think there was uncertainty um, between, um, you know, Alan and maybe Charlie taking more of a view of just what we are considering tidal wetland line to wetland um, buffer in this case, whether there is one or isn't one. And then flowing from there, I think the calculations of net fill here are clear. I think we asked last time, and I don't think I've seen um, perme additional permeable inside and outside. And I think even with this net fill, it might be to see the whole project alongside the wetland permit. Um, and then fi final point for me is just on that last exchange, if it's a minor amount of fill, maybe maybe the applicant, if they have to address things otherwise, is able to you know re just move that fill that net fill out of the wetland permit area if it's a, if it's a small amount. Um, and then maybe that's a, a good way for uh, us to address it. So 
uh, those are those are my comments. Probably the most important one is the Kellogg Sessions comments. Could you mention Earl Rourke. You're making reference to what what your nine points was it was it circulated to? I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm guessing, Andrew. You probably have not even seen it because it only came to us during this meeting, unfortunately. So it's it's dated today, um, and uh, that's we we didn't we weren't aware of it until the meeting started. Um, we had the same situation on our prior applicant. Yeah, I was dealing with Ryan. Uh, with Ryan, I guess he left. I didn't even know that he left uh, Keller's sessions on on the previous review. So I haven't seen anything as far as any comments. On, you know. Can I make a comment with regard to one of those comments? Um, the you know the, the 2015 New York uh, New York State Stormwater Management Design Manual specifically identifies that what's called overbank flood control and extreme flood control criteria do not apply for a direct discharge to tidal waters, which this is. So I'm actually a little bit surprised that Keller Sessions would bring that up and say that is necessary to detain the 25-year storm. Um, when they know, and I know they know, that the Stormwater Management Design Manual specifically identifies that that's not required. Yes, but the, uh, per the uh, village code, um, there, there are um, requirements that are have to be, that have to be met based off the limit of disturbance that you're doing on site. We, we are, we are the, the, the increase in impervious surface is what we have to detain, and that's 692 square feet. And based on the perk rate, we've provided it. So I don't know where, you know, I, without seeing the, the comments, I can't. Well, you know. there was, there, there was, there was a, um, I did, pre I did prepare the last, the last time this application was um, up in the, H the last HCMZ meeting that this application was appeared on. I did provide a, a, uh, a you killer session, a, 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 um, a memo. So, to, to my knowledge, was submitted to the village and should have been submitted to the applicant um, to address for this meeting. I would have, you know, gladly addressed it, but if I don't receive it, I can't address it. I, I got to be honest, uh, Chair and, and, and members of the commissioners, I, I, not just only as someone who's very involved here in the community and, and as, a, as an attorney advocating on behalf of a, an establishment that's been here and a good neighbor for a hundred years, it, it is, it is, it's a little bit frustrating and, and I, I will try to, I'm, I'm biting the side of my cheek that, you know, again, we had a, a very, I, I think you, we did a tremendous job or you did a tremendous job vetting the application uh, several weeks ago Really, we arrived at about four points, all of which we dove into, not making this an academic exercise, rather a, a you know diligent effort to come prepared, ready to address these issues. And to be told, you know, on the night during the course of our application or our presentation, oh, there's nine other comments. I mean, we got to do better. We have to do better because it's embarrassing not only for the village, but it's embarrassing for the applicants. It's embarrassing for the attorneys that are advocating the consultants. We have to do better. And I am saying this as someone who's very involved in this community. We, we, we can't do things like this. I mean, we will come back. Obviously, it, it looks like we're going to a direction where we're going to have to go back. We're going to be coming to the planning board next week. But I don't care who, what consultants we're using. These are my tax dollars too. Whoever is utilizing these consultants, we need to be able to get this information before the applicant actually appears the night of. It, 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 we've got to do better. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm not, I'm venting, but not just, I'm, and not the commissioners, you, you're, you're like me, we're residents, we do a job, we're trying to protect the integrity and protect this community. But it's frustrating because, you know, again, my clients are looking at me saying, you know, Spats, well, you're an attorney, why are we just finding about this now? And, and it, as a community, Mamaroneck Village is the gold standard for the Sound Shore. We can do better than this. So that's something that we can take up uh, during subcommittee meetings amongst ourselves with all the, you know, whether it's zoning board, flood mitigation, whatever committee, but we, we can do better than that. So I, I said my little, I'm on my soap, you know, my, my soap box, whatever. And, and um, I, I guess we'll get that report at some point and we'll follow up. I mean, is there anything else on there that we can maybe discuss tonight so we know 
really what are the star points that you want chair and commissioners you want this addressed i mean all points should be addressed but i want to know that when we come back here i want to make sure we have it all done chair we want to do it right we want to be great we don't want to do a good job we want to do a great job and we that's you you are not wrong about getting getting last minute information and i on on behalf of the the village and the staff i apologize for that we we should not be getting uh, we should not be getting engineering comments tonight of because you have no ability to address them and we have no ability to consider them. That's a drop ball. Uh, I had thought sure, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I, I serve on, on committees. And so, you know what, it's us together. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank we, you. It's us together. I had, I really like two touch applications where we do a preliminary and we do a final and we get a vote. I was really hoping that we had two of those tonight. Um, <laughs> so this, I try to be as transparent about what my concerns are as I can, not just for the applicant in front of me, but for the other applicants. We've, so I come out of tonight um, have, having, having two things foremost in my mind. Um, when, you know, when, when I said I wanted a wetland scientist, I, I meant I wanted a wetland scientist. Now, if, if, that's, if that's an applicant problem, um, and that's, you know, to be blunt, that's for the consistency of the way we apply mostly policy 44. That's for the consistency of the way we apply that policy rules, the same for everybody. Um, I think, you know, it, we can, I can feel like I've got that record. If we have Sven Hoger look at it instead, uh, if, if the applicant has somebody that they want to have, that's fine too. Or the village works with Sven, the, the commission works with Sven all the time, one okay. way or another before I vote consistency on, on this application, I want to have somebody whose you know, letters after their name say they're a scientist, not that they're an engineer and landscape architect, with all due respect to your practical experience, Mr. Pilch, but, you know, with, but, with, but bearing in mind as a lawyer, what I want to have is my record. Um, that's a box I'm going to need to check. And I've been as transparent as I can about how I think about net fill in floodplains. I've been as transparent as I can. I didn't think that was gonna be a concern on this project. It turns out it is. I've told you how I see it. Yes. Uh, 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 by the way, we did, uh, thank you, Charles. I just got the, um, the memo dated today. Th thank you. And I'll pass that on to my, my, uh, my client and, his, and the consultants. Thank you, Charles. I, I had a quick question on it. Um, it, if I could, uh, I, I was a little unclear Elo, from the- yourself. Elo, just introduce yourself, oh. please. Oh, hi, um, Elo Comfort. I'm a uh, club president at Orienta uh, for the moment. And- um, <laughs> It's all right, it, you'll be fine. <laughs> next time we come back, somebody else will probably be sitting in my chair. But uh, um, I just wanted to clarify one item uh, that was a little unclear to me from how the discussion went. Um, and it was with regards to the retaining wall as the 100 year or, or as the buffer zone. So um, our, our, our consultant had mentioned that uh, DEC considers that the end of the buffer zone, um, but uh, it, I don't think we had 100% uh, clarification on what Mamernik considers the buffer zone. So I, I was hoping um, that uh, you guys could advise us on what that would be, ju just so we're confirmed. Because it, it seems like if the buffer zone ends at the stone wall, then we would be out, we could potentially be out of the buffer zone. DEC and village treat these two different things. DEC says if there's a 10 foot sea wall there, uh, that's the end of it. We don't concern ourselves with what's landward of that. That is not how the village treats it. And the village uh, treats it as a as 100 foot, foot buffer for mean high water, even if there's an intervening sea wall. So okay. that, I think that that should answer your question. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. It's, and I, and I, I also don't want to be confused about uh, about the net fill issue. That's not that's not a wetland issue, though. Everything that happens in the wetland buffer is a wetland buffer issue. That's a floodplain issue. Just just so we're clear on that, we've uh, we, we've very consistently 
uh, told applicants we have we have a problem with net fill and a buffer, and we usually find that they're able to do something that that means that there's no net fill in the buffer, so that they're not taking away flood volume, et cetera. Sounds good. I I think we can work on it. Yeah. Chair, um, uh, Commissioner O'Rourke had asked a, a question about this uh, area in the uh, in the uh, 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 tidal wetland buffer. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if he, it, I had, do you, am I still sharing the screen? Yeah. You see the yep. Yes, that, we got the map up. Yeah, right, that I, tabulation I, I, shows what the net increase is in the wetland buffer of, what is it, 340 square feet of, of yep. intrusion. Thank you very and much. And I think I, it, it's broken up, you know, like the south and the, the north is the, the majority of it. And then the... Uh, and that's for the impervious surface, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, All right. So I I think I want I want to make sure that we haven't cut off discussion before and any other commissioners have gotten to raise their concerns because you want to have anything that's going to be issue you want to you want to Please. address so that hopefully when we come through we'll just nod our heads and then I'll say does everybody have enough information to vote and they'll all say yes and then we'll all vote. Um, we've heard from me, we've heard from Seamus, uh, Andrew. I'm good. I'm good. Randy. Randy's on mute too. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have a quick finger there, Randy. That's why he's. <laughs> He's got his hand signals going. He's doing his head. I think they said yes. Andrew Maggio, you're 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 a hunter though, Maggio, so that doesn't count. You're quick on the trigger. <laughs> Did Randy have any questions? I didn't Randy, hear. Randy, uh, further questions or concerns you want to raise so they know what's what's in your head? Yeah, he, he he says I think he says he's good. And uh, and Lisa. Yeah, I'm good too. And I just want to say I appreciate Mr. Spatz's comments earlier about getting the documentation late. It, it slows everybody down. Um, and I think uh, your points were very well made. Thank you. And I, and I mean that with the utmost respect for everyone that sits and spends time. It's 930. You're, you work, your fam you have family. Uh, we have hardworking members of our community that work for the municipality. It's a collective effort. So if, if it, again, if it, my communication came off terse, it wasn't meant to be, but I know what we can do. And, and yeah, yeah thank you. No, so. Not at all. I felt you were very respectful and I just felt your comments were exactly right on. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I have a question for you, actually. I, just stepping back, I, I want to make sure with the impervious versus pervious with the actual surface itself, can we flush that out now so that when we come back, we're good? And also, I just want to make sure you're satisfied by the site plan. Uh, site so, plan, excuse me. So, so I said before that one of the two ways that that uh, concerns fall off my radar screen is I got information. I have the written comments that address the pervious impervious. I understand it. I feel like I've got the record. I need to cast my vote on that issue. Thank you. And then we're good on the uh, site from uh, Harbor Island. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. That okay. concern too, having received further information, okay. it's fallen off my radar Perfect. screen. It's no longer a concern. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So I, Alan, I know, and I know how that will affect my vote. I don't need further information on that to cast a vote. <laughs> well, that, if that were the case, yeah, I mean, we can make that happen. Well, I don't need further information on, on that. You know, every, every policy you have, you have my live concerns. I've said That's what okay. they are. More importantly, Alan and Nunzio and Peter, you guys understand really what we need to do. This is, goes now to the wetland. It goes to the um, goes to the fill. These are engineering components. Um, very good. So listen, uh, we will hopefully come back to you. April. Well, yeah, we'll be back in April. And we'll still go to planning uh, next week and um, do the, uh, you know, the circuit. I'm really optimistic that we'll be able to just get this voted uh, in due course without a lot of, uh, with a lot of, so, without a lot of further discussion. Well, Chair, we'll good? call it two and a half touch. How about that? 2.5. <laughs> that, that, that would be nice. I like to get the, the applicant items 
right. to a vote and finish. Understood. Unless there are real concerns that we end up wrestling over. Some of them see a lot because they change a lot. I, I hope this will not be one. Hey, sorry, sorry to prolong, but let me just ask a quick question. I saw a reference in there somewhere to a wetland activity permit. Is that is that right? Who issues that? That's under the planning board, I believe. Under the oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, you know what, uh, Commissioner Work. I literally, I totally, I maybe it's just because it's been like a 14-hour day. I, yes, we're going. A little slow on the take. We're going to planning for the site for the site plan in the wetlands. Yes, we're going to get the permit for that. That's why we're going back next week. We've already filed, and, and that's in the works. So, yes. and, and, and what requires the wetland? Um, activity permit like what what triggers that for you guys that would be based upon um uh, just looking that would be based upon the fact that a portion of our proposed project actually goes um uh, in within the 100 foot okay yeah because i was wondering if that would answer some of our questions from earlier yeah no no yeah in fact yeah. You know, and, and, um, I, you may have received some of the materials. We submitted everything at the same time, both for the planning board and the updated uh, HC, HCCM information. So um, that's exactly what, what triggered that uh, commissioner work. Thank you for inquiring about that. So we'll be going, yes, we'll be going on a week from tonight um, for that. So, so can I just chime in and, and I have three questions I need to answer. Uh, uh, Chairman, so that wetland activity permit should take care of the wetland concerns for the HCZM, the granting of that wetland permit? Wetland permit application. The, right. The wetland concerns that we have are so, are different. We, we do a different thing than planning does, right? Planning okay. refers to us for consistency, and then we do a thing that planning doesn't do. We look okay. at 44 policies, and each of those, and we don't do this is better than that or better than it exists now. We do consistent or not consistent on each policy. Okay. They, they issue, planning issues a permit for, for a wetland activity. That's different than our consistency determination. Okay. Our consistency determination on wetlands issues is our enforcement of policy 44, which is to protect and preserve wetlands. The standard I mean, that's this, right? that we applied right. for years now has been, if you're going to do work in a buffer, we need a, a scientist to opine that it will cause no negative impact in the wetland. Now, I don't think that's particularly controversial here, but we are absolute in making that record. So that's what needs to happen for us to resolve that concern, not something at planning. We need to have the opinion we always ask for from a scientist saying no negative impact on the wetland from the work in the buffer. And then we can say, we have the record we need and we're ready to proceed to a vote. Got it, got it. Right. So Likewise, the cut fill is, is, is not somebody else's rule. It's our interpretation of how we handle floodplain development. And that's your concern okay. with policy 11. I just wanna make sure that's a number 11. Yep. So that's an 11 policy. My rebiology on the way to law school. That basically leaves three items. We have to address Keller Sessions comments, once I get them. We have to address the fill issue to get a net zero and we have to get the scientists and that, that should basically be the check off on, on getting the application approved, hopefully. That is everything I think I need to know in order to vote. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm taking the online course for marine biology tonight. Don't worry. And I think from my perspective, the colored sessions is important because like the stormwater and the SWIP and which that all interconnects with is, is sort of what I think provides um, validation to the increased permeable on, in, in the area. So I think that that's, sure. if, if something comes out of the back and forth on that, um, on that, it, you know, that, that's, that's why, that's where the focus comes from for me. Yeah, we'll make whatever modifications required, if, if any. Right. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, so I think without any other questions from anybody on my team, I think uh, we're good to go. We, we turned this thing around. I got worried for a moment there, Chair, but we were able to <laughs> bring it around. And I think we know exactly we got the course set. We know what we need. We'll see you back in uh, 30 days. So look forward to that. Likewise. Stay well, everyone. Be well. Have a good night, everyone. Thank good you night. all. Have a good night.
We've still got a uh, screen share up. Mm -hmm. Let me get, let me get that off. Thank you. All right, and with that, we have uh, we have exhausted our our applicant items for the evening. We have um, let if nobody objects. Um, I th I think I'm going to take the administrative items out of order because um, I think we probably want to talk about the outfall jetty first. Um, although we don't have to because there's no LWRP update in addition to what oh. we did in the work session. So I'll get, I'm getting comments from Charlie. I'll put them into the draft. I'll update, um, you know, Steve's working on the table of contents. So I think we'll have an additional draft for the next work session. Thank you, Seamus. I continue to be very grateful for your diligent work in moving that forward. Um, on the outfall jetty, uh, Andrew, you this is this is this is really your issue, and I'll I'll let you take it. Yes, uh, so we have a Thomas and I worked on a letter to the board of trustees that was circulated from what, from what I understand. And does anyone have any comments on that? Did everyone well, great? Did, did everyone see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that acceptable? Yes. Okay, so I spoke to Amber today. Uh, Amber, correct me if I'm wrong. You can fabricate a uh, Harbor Coastal Commission letterhead, and uh, and put that text on a on a letter. Is that too much of an imposition? No, I can do that. Okay, and then uh, should we um, should we forward slash uh, s forward slash that Thomas, or do you want to actually? Uh, get a copy, sign it, and uh, scan it, and go back, because I think we're under a little bit of time. <clears throat> we should get it done tomorrow, but I will I will have no difficulty doing that. I can I can wet ink, sign it, scan it, and send it back in about 10 minutes tomorrow. So okay. let's, let, let's do it the wet ink signature way. Okay. So um, we'll send that, uh, that letter out. And um, it, it's funny, I was speaking to some of the uh, uh, marine operators uh, today, and um, they uh, and, I, and I asked them about using that that pier as a as a work area, and uh, for some of the other contractors that were there, and, and the possibility to get some revenue for the village. And the consensus was that was kind of a good idea. So uh, I think this is important. I think it's important to the village. I think it's important for the for our process that the process be followed, and uh, that we, uh, we that you know we've already put a lot of time and effort and thought into what we should do there. I think we should follow through on that and get that letter out as soon as possible and uh, really uh, demand a response uh, as soon as possible from the board as to uh, whether or not we're gonna hold these municipalities to the same standards as we uh, hold the commercial real estate owners and the residential real estate owners. There's a process here and uh, it applies to everyone and it's important and uh, something should be done. Yeah, there's at best been it generously, we'll call it unclarity about whether governmental projects um, have to go through the same project uh, process, and there shouldn't be. They do, and yeah. it part of holding part of holding our our non-governmental applicants to the standards that we do, and we're a, you know we're a very substantive land use body. Um, is that we at least tell them, look, it's it's without fear or favor. We hold you to these high standards, and also your neighbors, and also the village, and also the county. And we can't, you know, we can't start not doing that. We'll do everything we can to move an applicant quickly, but they can't, you know, end run us by, you know, talking to staff and not telling us about it. There it is. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, and a citizen, a concerned citizen brought to our attention uh, landfilling at, um, at uh, an I-95 uh, work site on the thruway, uh, the southeast uh, corner lot of Maranac Avenue. Um, I don't, um, I, I need an update from staff on that.
Um, yeah. You mean in, in regard to the ownership? Yeah, where, who controls it and what can we do about it? Um, so, so it is controlled by the New York State Thruway. Um, it is not village owned property. I have um, forwarded the comments to our um, village staff, um, village managers. Uh, so there, ha there are not currently any new updates. Yeah, I, I think the solution to that, and, and from what I've recently learned is that there's a history. This isn't the first time there's been that issue. I think, I think the solution, uh, and in the interest of moving forward and, and just resolving this, I think that we should tell the village managers that the that the appropriate remedy for this is for one or both of the managers to tell the throwaway authority that uh, there should be proper silt fencing up there. Uh, the stockpiling is is obviously uh, something they have to do, but um, preventing that uh, runoff and preventing. Uh, uh, silting of the river, that waterway near there, uh, th that's something within. And we've, we've done that before. So there, there's a precedent for that. So it, it's just as simple as either calling or emailing uh, someone at the New York State Thruway Authority by, a, by an official, uh, preferably the village manager, or the assistant village manager saying, we see you have um, uncovered uh, earth there. Uh, please put up the proper sediment controls. Is that something we can do? So if I just may for a second, um, typically when matters come up before this board, I run an internal conflict check to make sure there's no legal conflicts. Um, our firm does represent the New York State Thruway Authority. Um, I don't know in what capacity, it's not myself. So for the time being, um, I'm gonna recuse myself from any conversation until I get that conflict cleared up just so I don't make any missteps. Okay, fair. Actually, Charles, it, it might be easier that if you pick up the phone because uh, that, that you, you might be more of a facilitator than, uh, than well, someone. Well, it, it, it may be the case that our work with the Thruway Authority is not ongoing and closed. So right. if that is the case, happy to do that. I just have to figure out what the extent of our current representation is. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't see the village being an adverse party no. to the New York State Thruway. And, and if you've got people that you can call, boy, that would really uh, expedite things. If you feel comfortable and, and talk about it with whomever you have to talk, talk to about. But uh, that's actually, uh, I see that as a positive, not, not really a negative. No, I agree. Um, and actually, Teresa Baker, uh, my partner who represents the planning board, she actually does specific work with the authority in the past. Um, so I will see what I can find out and, you know, work together without any issues as best I can. Right. And, and we're just asking for like uh, straw bales and a, and a silk fence. I, I don't think it's more than that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. So, and the only other item we had on our agenda was minutes. Um, fr frankly, there was a there was a lot of material to get through this time, and uh, I didn't have any time with the minutes. I don't like to vote on them when I haven't really had a chance to look. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, punt minutes, and with that, we've run our agenda. Does anybody else have new business? Sounds like we don't. So I think we can close this out and get to bed. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. And we are closed. Thank you so much for your time. We're all volunteer. Well, the commissioners are all volunteers and it's always late. It's a lot of work. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.